Hi, this is Steve Giddings. I thought I'd show a series of slides to bring you up to date on the status of new lionfish traps that we're hoping fishers will adopt to catch and sell lionfish. So while they make some money, they'll also be doing conservation work by taking lionfish off deep reefs and hard bottoms. Both deep and shallow water control of lionfish are critical if we want to protect invaded Western Atlantic ecosystems. We've been gradually developing lionfish traps to support a deep water fishery for the last five or six years. I'll present a short history of the design work on the traps, then show the results of work that Holden Harris and others are doing on the latest version of the traps. Lionfish won't be eradicated from the still growing invaded range, but impacts to native ecosystems could be controlled through commercialization. Demand for lionfish as seafood exceeds supply, meaning there is an opportunity for commercial growth. Restaurants and retailers want lionfish, new food products and cookbooks are being sold, and new markets are being developed for people who make jewelry from lionfish. Meanwhile, there's a huge, virtually untapped supply of lionfish in deep water beyond scuba depths. Divers can easily remove lionfish with spears down to about 30 meters or 100 feet or so, the light blue areas on this map. But the darker blue are deep waters in the invaded range that are not being cleared of lionfish right now. Traps are probably the most effective approach to reduce lionfish populations and protect native species at these depths. With the right gear, commercial trap fishing could reduce lionfish populations throughout the invaded range without negatively affecting the environment. The traps we've been working on are effective, low-impact, FAD-based non-containment traps. FAD stands for fish aggregation device, and it means there's no bait, and the trap depends on the fish being attracted to a vertical structure alone. And lionfish are very attracted to structure, much more than other fish, and that reduces bycatch. The open net uh, prevents ghost fishing if the trap is lost. Because they lie flat, the traps are transportable in large numbers on a boat and easy to deploy and retrieve. Our first tests of prototypes off Pensacola showed good capture rates, but some lionfish remained outside the frame because the uprights act like fads themselves. So we tried to create a design without any external structure. This dome trap was built to remove all uprights with the exception of the fad. And it attracted lionfish, but the flat frame descended too slowly through the water because of resistance. It also had a solid central fad, which made it difficult for a fishing boat to carry a lot of traps. The current trap design allows the traps to be thrown overboard floats on the harness, causes them to orient vertically and travel through the water at about three feet a second. When they hit the bottom, the curved deflectors cause the jaws to separate and lay flat uh, on the bottom. The buoyant fad stands up off the bottom to attract lionfish from nearby reefs or to serve as shelter or rest during hunting transits. The next two video clips show the trap being deployed and retrieved. Watch how the trap springs open when it hits the bottom and then how the loose netting billows when it's pulled, allowing the jaws to close completely before the net touches any of the fish inside. By the time the net would collapse and touch the fish, the jaws are fully closed. Recently, we started building traps without any welding at the hinges and simplifying the bending process to make it possible for anyone with rebar and a straight angle bender to build them. 
There's no need to do a curved bend if straight sides are easier. And tight bends at the axle points allow you to create a hinge point using only the loops bent into the rebar. Mark Moran with Reef Save built this rebar bender by cutting some small pieces of steel bar for mandrels and some sturdy pipes. Using cheater pipes on both sides reduces stress on the bender and whatever pedestal it's built on. Tight loops at one end of each jaw and above the deflector on the other are insertions for the axle, creating a hinge. A loop and a bend on the ends of the axle hold it in place. It's been recommended to us that we dip the bends in marine epoxy to fill any micro fractures that form with the extremely tight bending that we do. A priority now is to get professional fishermen to try the traps and help figure out the best ways to fish them, as well as improve designs to make them more durable and reliable under the harsh conditions of the real ocean environment. Meanwhile, several research groups have been modifying designs and evaluating the effectiveness of the traps in different habitats and developing fishing techniques that best suit their location. We're attempting to coordinate these efforts to more rapidly determine what designs and operations are most effective and which have the least risk in terms of bycatch, habitat impacts, entanglement risk for marine mammals and turtles, and ghost fishing. We hope these findings will help guide trap regulations and permitting in the affected countries. Holden Harris and several others recently published a paper on tests they did of the Giddings Trap, as they call it, near high-density artificial reefs in depths of about 125 to 130 feet on the West Florida Shelf. They found traps attracted about 10 times more lionfish than all native fish combined. In 82 trap sets, a total of 327 lionfish and 29 native fish were recruited to the traps. Lionfish recruitment was highest in traps placed within about 15 meters of reefs with a one-day soak time. Average recruitment was about 5 lionfish per trap and 0.1 native fish. In a follow-up study, they compared catch rates in spiny lobster traps, South Atlantic sea bass pots, and the Giddings lionfish trap. They did 300 trap deployments, 100 of each type, between 40 and 80 meters depth, about 130 to 250 feet. The Giddings traps outperformed the other trap designs with both higher lionfish removals and lower bycatch of native species. Bycatch rates for lobster traps and sea bass traps in these tests were unacceptably high for a lionfish trap fishery. Lobster traps caught 30 times more native fish than lionfish by weight, and sea bass pots caught over 150 times more native fish. Cameras attached to the traps in the deep tests showed that lionfish catch could be optimized with a two-day soak time and pulling the traps in the morning. Lionfish numbers in the traps at dawn were over 50% higher than at midday. Ultimately, the catch rates that Holden's team found in deep water were not high enough to support a commercial fishery. But tests with commercial fishers in their fishing grounds will be conducted in the coming year and led through a NOAA grant to the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. It will be led by Dr. Ali Candelmo at Reef and done in the Florida Keys. We're looking forward to see what professional fishers think of the traps, how they modify the design, how they fish the traps, and whether they get high enough catch rates to support a fishery for lionfish.